Let us pray. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Almighty God, Lord of hosts, encourage us with the assurance that you are with us always, and that with you at our side, we need never fear. In the Savior's name we pray. Amen. Dear fellow redeemed, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our meditation today is from the book of Judges, the seventh chapter. Select verses beginning with the first verse. Then Jerubal, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him set out and camped by the spring of Harod. The Midianite camp was north of him in the valley below the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, There are too many people with you for me to give Midian into your hands. If I did that, Israel would glorify itself at my expense and say, My own hand has delivered me. So then make an announcement for the people to hear. Whoever is trembling with fear can return home and fly away from Mount Gilead. 22,000 people turned and left. Only 10,000 remained. The Lord said to Gideon, There are still too many people. Lead them down to the water, and there I will refine them further for you. If I tell you this one will go with you, he may go with you. But if I say to you this one will not go with you, he must not go. So Gideon led the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Place everyone who laps water with his tongue as a dog would lap to one side. Place everyone who kneels down to drink on the other side. The number of those who lapped, those who put their hands to their mouths, was 300 men, while all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. The Lord said to Gideon, With the 300 men who lapped, I will deliver you, and I will give Midian into your hand. As for all the other people, let each man go back to his place. He divided the 300 men into three groups. He placed a ram's horn into the hand of each one of them, as well as empty jars with torches inside them. Then he said to them, watch me and do whatever I do. When you see me arrive at the edge of the camp, do whatever I do. When I and all the men who are with me blow our ram's horns, the rest of you who are around the whole camp also blow your ram's horns and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon and the 100 men with him went to the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just after the Midianites had posted the guards. Gideon and his men blew their ram's horns and shattered the jars that were in their hands. All three groups blew their ram's horns and broke their jars. They held the torches in their left hands and in their right hands they held the ram's horns that they were to blow. They shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Each man stood at his station around the camp. The whole Midianite camp started running, raised the alarm, and fled. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Recall the cycle of Israel's behavior at this time. First apostasy, then oppression, then deliverance, and finally rest, before repeating the cycle again. And now when Gideon came on the scene, Israel was being oppressed for their apostasy, oppressed by the Midianites. And now he was raised as the deliverer or judge to save them. All the judges were men of action. Gideon's fight, however, is one of the most impressive, not because he was a strong man of almost mythological proportions, and not because he mustered the, all the power of the people against Midian, but because the victory was won with an absurdly small 300-man army. The clear testimony of this account is that the victory is the Lord's. The Holy Spirit wishes this account to impress a number of lessons on our hearts in application to our own lives. And the first of these is that we cannot honestly praise ourselves, but only Him. Gideon began with a great army. You see, 32,000 soldiers marched with him at the start. Now, still, Midian's army was more than four times its size. With these numbers... If Gideon had won, human nature would be inclined to praise his military prowess, perhaps to give some thanks to God, but to attribute the majority of the victory to the judge Gideon himself or to the soldiers. So God's plan was conscious to permit men only to glorify him. In stages, God directed Gideon to pare the army down, First, those who were afraid were allowed to leave. 
more than two-thirds of the army, so that only 10,000 remained. And next, God instructed the final division of the troops based on how they drank water at the river. Those who lapped it from their hands were permitted to stay in the army, while those who knelt down were sent home. And there have been many interpretations about why God chose this metric and why this would indicate the ones that were supposed to stay. Ideas are given about which form of drinking indicated more bravery, which indicated more readiness for battle or more obedience. But none of that is really substantial. The point is that God wished to pare down the army to the number that he had elected to bring glory to himself in victory. 300. The writer tells us that God meant to refine the army. This was a purification as metal is refined or purified so that only its purest form remains. That's not to say that the 300 left had any glory in themselves because God expressly excluded that possibility but that they were instead sanctified by God through these tests. And this was all meant to point back to God. And these 300 were divided into three groups of 100 each. And even here we can see God pointing to himself, the three in one almighty who would win the victory. Now strategically, this was a relatively wise maneuver, surround the enemy, However, with such a massive outnumbering of their force, it would still be a simple thing for the Midianites to overcome Gideon and his army. What he should have done is what the Spartans did in the famous Battle of Thermopylae. And there, 300 men held off a massive force by making use of a natural narrow pass. The much larger Persian army had to send in only smaller groups to fight against the much stronger Spartan warriors. And by this strategy, a smaller army could overcome a much larger army. But God did not want these soldiers in Israel to glorify themselves, to glorify their own military prowess or their strength. He would have the victory. So what strategy did the Israelite army employ? They blew their ram's horns and broke their jars. They held the torches in their left hands, and in their right hands they held the ram's horns that they were to blow. They shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. They didn't wield swords. Their hands were occupied with the ram's horn and with the torches. No room for any weapons for them to fight with. In brief, therefore, the army of Gideon defeated Midian by praising the Lord. Certainly some of the natural confusion and panic was caused by this strategy, but the hand of the Lord is what actually caused the defeat of this army. The only weapon actually wielded by the Israelites was what Paul called the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God with music, with praise to God, the enemies of God's people were defeated. The psalmist unites the concepts of music and praise and the Lord's victory. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your mercy in the morning and your faithfulness every night. Without a doubt, your enemies, O Lord, without a doubt, your enemies will perish. All evildoers will be scattered but you have raised my horn like that of a wild ox. I am drenched with fresh oil. My eyes have looked in triumph over my adversaries. When evildoers rise against me, my ears hear their defeat. The defeat of the enemies in that song is put in future tense. Your enemies will perish. And yet the song is still sung. This victorious song as though it's already accomplished. That's an exercise of faith. So we also sing in our Easter hymns, we proclaim the wonders God hath done. We remember his victories in the past, even while we still anticipate the victory that he will 
give to us. Once this perishable body has put on imperishability and this mortal body has put on immortality, then what is written will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Because you see, the, the resurrection of Christ is the victory that God accomplished over sin, death, and the devil. And it is a victory that he gives to us by faith so that we also will rise, receiving that victory, proving the victory that we have. And therefore, this also presents the next lesson of this text, that with God, we have a majority. Think for a moment about the perspective of the 9,700 who were directed to leave after drinking water. They were brave because the fearful ones had already voluntarily left. But nevertheless, Gideon sent them home. What were they thinking? Did they think that those 300 who went with Gideon were on a fool's errand? All the things that the world thinks about a small church might have been going through their minds. Why don't they take all the help they can get? Do they think they're better than us? I, I suppose they aren't really doing any harm, so let's let them think what they want until they all die out. That's what the world thinks of a small church. The world and many false teaching churches emphasize the numbers that by uniting together larger groups, somehow that indicates more truth or at least a better equipment to do God's work. But God does not judge truth or righteousness by the numbers. He is right. He is true and he is holy. And so anyone who is opposed to him, however large their force, are wrong. And so if we are allied with him, then we have the true majority. Think of the prophet Elisha. The king of Aram sent a large army to go and seize him. Elisha's servant saw all these soldiers coming, these horses and chariots surrounding the city, and he fell into a panic. But Elisha told him, don't be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And with prayer, God opened that servant's eyes to see, and all around the army that had come to take his prophet, the hills were full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Or think of Jesus' words. Do you not realize that I could call on my father and at once he would provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? At other times, God defended his people against a much larger force. As when Pharaoh pursued them into the Red Sea, God was a pillar of fire to defend them. Or when they came against Jericho, the Son of God appeared as a mighty warrior, and God himself caused those walls to collapse in on themselves. God himself fights for his people. And with him at your side are also his legions of angels. They themselves sing and rejoice to aid you in the victory against the forces of the devil. Recall how God burst into history when he took on human flesh. Out to a small company of shepherds in the field at night, there appeared a multitude from the heavenly army praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward mankind. That Christmas night was the night that God sent his champion, the greatest judge-deliverer, so that he would surround the forces of darkness. He laid his trap for sin and the devil, and he sprang it when it looked as though that soldier was defeated. Jesus clearly in a minority when even his small band of 12 
had abandoned him, and all the rest cried against him as he died on the cross. Through that very event, he was destroying death itself. This is what it is, is meant when we say that the victory is the Lord's. He won it. Where we, no matter how many allies we would be able to muster, would never be able to do so. He won it so that he would give it to us. The Lutheran confessions speak of faith in this way. For faith justifies and saves not on the grounds that it is a work in itself worthy, but only because it receives the promised mercy. Believing the promise, we have that salvation, we have that victory given to us through God's word and sacraments. And faith is also called worship as well. Thus God wished himself to be known, thus he wishes himself to be worshipped, that from him we receive benefits, and receive them too because of his mercy, not because of our merits. And this gives us reason to worship and praise and sing, both because we have received such blessings from our Lord, and because we shall receive the greatest victory ever won and the crown of conquering champions, the crown of life and the glory of the Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, forevermore. Amen. Once again, I'd like to appeal to you, if you uh, are, have it in, you, in your power and, and ability and, and uh, your, your desire, please continue to contribute to the offerings of this church uh, to, to keep up the, the regular ongoing uh, work that we have to do to keep paying our bills and things like that. Uh, thank you to all who have continued to, to, to send in their support. Uh, if you have uh, your regular offering envelopes, again, uh, you can place your offering in that envelope and then put that inside a larger uh, envelope to mail it more securely, uh, or bring it by one of those times that I'm here at the church, uh, at the church building during my office hours. Uh, and during those times, too, you can come by and, and chat with me. Uh, we can have uh, a devotion or prayer. Uh, if, if you'd like, we can have a confession of sin. I can offer you the absolution of all your sins. Uh, and uh, for, for members here as well, I, I offer private communion. Uh, so that you continue to receive that sacrament as well. It looks like it'll be a number of weeks still before we reopen for regular services, but uh, be aware that we will continue to, to send out announcements as far as that on our Facebook page and website. Uh, I might even tack some of those things onto the videos when, uh, when we know more as that comes up as well. Uh, but please stay in touch, uh, continue to bear one another's burdens, uh, and let us know if there's anything that we can do to help you as well. So with that, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.